Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Melissa, and if you're new here, please be sure to subscribe for more astrology videos. Today, we're going to be answering some of your questions that I've collected through my blog. And if you want, you can go ahead and follow my Tumblr if you want at Lunar Cappy. This is where I collected all of my questions. I will most likely be doing another um, Q and A in the future so that's also where you can send in your questions if you're interested thank you so much if you have submitted a question so the first question comes from glass vessel and she asks he or she asks what do you think of opposite moon sign compatibility in any context he or she actually had a few um different questions listed so thank you so much for asking or for sending in your questions what do i think of opposite moon sign compatibility I think it's interesting. I think it really has an interesting dynamic because as is, as in the case of any opposite pairing, two people who have opposites of one particular placement, they will give each other the opportunity to learn from each other and to be each other's missing puzzle piece, I guess you can say. Each partner will see the other in a very extreme way or at least they'll come off that way because because they have very different ways of doing one particular thing. In the case of moon signs, it'll be about handling their emotions and expressing their emotions. If you have one moon sign and you see somebody else who has something completely opposite to you, you could be fascinated by it, you could be repulsed by it, you could be very open to it and open to learning from them because they do provide such a 180 degree opposite perspective from you. and that's where the learning can come in and I think that um, opposite moon sign pairings can be really interesting because of that. I think that it can really go either way to be honest where the people are just too different to really get on the same page emotionally to really like understand where the other person is coming from emotionally or why they're feeling that way, why they're reacting to a situation in a certain way. But on the other hand, they can help each other and fill in the areas where the other person or their partner is missing where they might be lacking any type of weakness that they might have their partner can like sort of fill in and be that strength for them class vessel's second question is what's anything you'd say as advice for any capricorn moons advice i would have to give us capricorn moons would probably be you don't have to be so careful and so cautious and inhibited all the time especially when it comes to how you're feeling and like letting your vulnerable side show, I think. We're just so careful about how we are expressing that and if we're ever feeling any sort of like tenderness or sensitivity, we our automatic reaction is to just hide it and to like suppress it maybe even, but for sure we kind of feel that emotion and just see it as a a weakness as a soft spot that you know not everybody should be able to see because it may make it might make us look a certain way and i think us capricorn moons really need to like let go of that stigma because it's not healthy and it doesn't feel good to know that you have to suppress or control a certain emotion just to save face, just to be seen a certain way and we're so concerned with our reputation and how we're being viewed and we just care so much about about being seen as weak and like expressing our emotions is a weakness and it, it's like it's just putting our hearts out there and we're just so scared and I think that being brave enough to show that vulnerability is really a strength. We don't always have to be so cautious and guarded about it all the time and it doesn't make us look a certain way and even if it does you know like people don't really care as much as we think they do. The third question they ask is what are your favorite houses and why? My favorite houses would have to be probably the fourth and the fifth houses. I really like those houses because the fourth is kind of like your safety net. It's sort of like your comfort zone and everything that makes you feel secure and it's also like your vulnerabilities and your deep emotional side that you really need to learn to protect and to guard. It's sort of like your home base and that's something that I'm really interested in learning about in astrology and, and exploring. Um, not just natally but also like synastry wise. I always like seeing that house pop up in synastry overlays. The fifth house too, 
Um, the fifth house is all about play and it's about your joy and expressing your inner child and just letting loose with that, you know, letting yourself be young and be playful and have fun. And I also find it really easy to interpret planets in the fifth house for some reason. I don't know why, but it's just for some reason I can put words to it because like it's something that I'm interested in and it resonates with me too. Like, yeah, I find the fifth house really fun and interesting to look at as well, natal or sinistry or anything just in general. So the next set of questions comes from, I'm not sure how to say your name, um, low filings. Is that right? <laughs> they asked, I would really like to know your take on whether sex is associated with the 8th or the 5th house and also Venus or Mars since I've seen so much talk about it. And this is a really good question because different houses can cover the same topic and their themes can overlap sometimes. They Each house or each planet, even though it covers the same topic, it might have a different approach to it and so, or it might put the same topic within a different context. Like for example, the fifth and the eighth houses, yes, both of them rule sexuality, but the fifth house is all about procreation and it's about sex for creating something. You know, the fifth house is all about self-expression and creativity and that includes procreation so sex can fall under that and it also examines um sex or sexual relationships in a very like light-hearted playful casual way whereas the eighth house um is about two souls bonding during a sexual exchange during intimacy and eighth house really stresses the intimacy factor of sex whereas the fifth house is more about like i don't know sex on the first date or something like that you know just for for pleasure for fun and the eighth house isn't really about pleasure at all it's really about surrendering and it can cover that part or that side of sex where you are surrendering your soul to the other person and you're giving up control to them or on the other hand it can emphasize the, the whole taking control of another person sexually and possessing another person sexually. So that's how the two differ in covering that specific subject. Oh, and also the eighth house is also about shared resources. It's about what you gain from a partner when you partner when you team up with them. It's what you share with them intimately. It's your secrets, and that includes sex. That includes, you know, the deepest most or what most people would consider a very deep and bonding experience what you are sharing with another person the most private and most intense form of sharing with another person basically and that includes sex and then venus and mars venus and mars mars mostly covers sex more than venus actually venus a little bit too but it's not really so much about the act of sex itself where, like Mars is. Mars is literally passion that can cover your sexual nature. It covers your animal instincts that can also cover sex. And whereas Venus is all about how you attract and it's, it's the person's loving side. Whether affection can include sex or not is debatable. It's, it depends on each chart and each sign. So... Um, yeah, Venus doesn't really cover so much about sex. It can. That's not really what it's all about. As much as Mars is associated with it. Okay, so the next question that uh, Low Filings asks is maybe some astrology learning tips. I somewhat know all the basics, but I feel stuck and don't know how to move forward and learn more. I would say if you're a beginner and let's say you know the basics down pat, right? I would suggest taking things apart bit by bit. If you're trying to learn more about studying natal charts, definitely go slow, definitely have all of the signs, planets, and houses down as much as possible. First, you can get, after that, you can get further into aspects and learning the basic meanings of aspects. And I think it really helps a lot to Try to form the connections between planets via aspect on your own first and try to interpret it that way first and foremost before like going straight for like a book that explains exactly what Mercury conjunct Mars means, you know. Um, I think it's good to get that practice of like forming the interpretation 
yourself first and like because that that um really exercises the critical thinking side and like the creativity side i think of learning astrology um because memorizing things is one thing like memorizing concepts and interpretations is one thing but really understanding it and really understanding why it works and being able to apply that understanding to all kinds of aspects no matter what it is that's a whole different thing and that's that's totally different from just memorizing something memorizing a meaning if you're able to come up with your own interpretations and have it make sense based on the, each separate part of the aspect like that's really going to help you in the long run and that's going to bring you closer to being able to interpret any chart any aspect that you come across and also i would suggest to yeah like what i said earlier like start small and take it apart piece by piece and after that you'll be able to like you're gonna want to start with what planet it is let's say you're looking at a particular position a particular placement that you have let's say you had mars in leo in the ninth house okay so you're gonna take it apart look at the planet first and that is the energy that is being focused on that's the energy that is being expressed okay and then that energy is filtered through the sign and the sign describes how that energy is expressed it colors it differently and each sign will have a different at its, at its own unique flavor to that planet now you're going to look at the house the house is where this is happening and where this energy is being focused it's where you can feel that energy the most in your life and it's in the ninth house so you're going to apply that planet's expression specifically through the sign in that area of your life which is the house um so that's one way to like take it apart piece by piece take apart each of your placements and examine it that way doing that first you'll be able to connect those with the aspects and see how the aspects from other planets can modify that first interpretation basically okay so the next question that we have is from anonymous and they ask I really want to apply my still very basic knowledge about astrology in study. What placements or planets should I look at so I could develop better studying habits or just anything that needs discipline or stimulation of the mind? You want to look at uh, Mercury, first of all. You want to look at your Mercury sign and the aspects. The house is going to show what part of your life you're the most curious about. And that's the part of your life where you will willingly want to learn more about the sign is how you are how you're able to focus or how you're able to learn the best okay so you definitely want to look at that and the aspects different aspects from different planets are going to change the way that you think it's going to change your mercury expression so let's say if you had like mars aspecting your mercury Mars speeds things up so that helps you learn things very quickly or and at the same time impatiently so you're not going to really have much patience for anything that you're not particularly interested in learning about and you can like jump from quickly from subject to subject so that requires a little bit more concentration whereas a Mercury aspecting Saturn is really going to help you um study something until like you're the freaking master of it saturn gives you patience it kind of does the opposite of what mars does saturn gives you patience and it um it allows you to be very steady and very consistent with your learning for a very long time and another thing that you could also look at really is your rising sign because and your third house your rising sign is going to show your how you handle new situations and that can include new areas of study it'll describe how you jump into the subject and it's how you like sort of approach it initially so anything that doesn't really appeal to your rising sign and any planets in the first house too is going to affect the way that you study and the way that you think the way that you concentrate also look at your third house your third house specifically covers communication and 
uh, your thought processes and how you learn it. It literally covers early learning experiences, early learning environments. That includes grade school. And if you want to look at the ninth house, if you're in college, you can do that too. The ninth house covers higher learning and university experiences and how you study like bigger, broader topics like the meaning of life and <laughs> philosophy and, you know, just bigger questions that require like deeper thinking whereas the third house is just you know simple everyday calculations and it's your basic learning habits basically what you have developed early on in life based on your early learning experiences so you can look at each of those individual things and see how best you can learn and use those qualities to learn better so the next question is from old soul in a new era and they ask, what is your take on Lilith Ascendant Aspects? Lilith Ascendant Aspects. So your Ascendant is it's your outlook on life. It's how you are seen by the world. It's how you're received. And it's your the conscious energies that you're expressing and putting out into the world. And Lilith is defiant. Lilith is that defiant, independent, no fucks given energy. It comes across as dark and manipulative and, you know, like all lower level, you know, unevolved, lower octave types of energies. Lilith also covers the sexual side of you that you repress, that you are ashamed of. And so Lilith aspects to the Ascendant. This would connect those two sides of you. This would connect your um, everything that you're afraid of or anything that you're ashamed of ashamed of showing and you're connecting that with your natural self-expression and your how you're being seen so Lilith aspects to the ascendant can be very frightening but also very refreshing depending on how you look at it depending on who you're asking and who who is meeting you for the first time maybe they are intrigued by it and maybe they are scared of you <laughs> but it all depends on how you handle it and how you express that and how you're incorporating it is it constructive is it uh is it strategic and are you are is it coming off in in a way that rubs people the wrong way because i feel like any person with strong lilith in their chart is able to take control of that and they can express it however they want really lilith aspecting the ascendant or just having strong lilith in general in your chart is really going to give you that tendency to just not give a fuck and not really do anything just for the sake of being socially acceptable or for being well received by others you know doesn't care maybe you as as a lilith um a strong lilith chart person really has that quality to them where you just do what you want basically and you're very independent very rebellious uh the next question is from anonymous asking what dictates your mental monologue your mercury moon or combination of both so the Mercury and the Moon, these are both what's going on inside of you. And yeah, they both do really heavily contribute to a, your mental energy, your mental, your self-talk, basically, I think is what you're trying to say. So the Moon more so covers the intuitive aspect of all of this, of your self-talk is more of the, a subconscious thing or like, where uh, you're not even always aware that it's happening or that you're feeling this way or that you're thinking this way or having like that this inner environment is taking place. The moon is not always rational. It's all about feelings and sensitivity and intuition and the emotional side. Um, whereas your mercury is all logic. Being placed in another element like let's say water, that's really going to increase the intuition of your mercury and make it a little bit less logical but generally speaking mercury is mercury tries to make sense of things and it it has to be able to be explained in words mercury and the moon really differ in this way your mercury is like literally your thoughts and what goes through your head the way that you're thinking the way that your brain is making sense of things that you're seeing or experiencing from the outside whereas the moon is your unconscious reactions to outer stimuli. It's your unconscious emotional reactions 
and how you are reacting inwardly first before you express it. Okay, so the next question is from Anonymous asking, what placements do you look at if you want to know how to take care of your health? There's different things you can look at. Usually the sixth house is associated with health and your body. Um, any type of ailments that you might have are, are usually associated with the sixth house. Your sixth house also covers like your everyday dealings and your everyday responsibilities, you know, and that includes your health, taking care of your health, taking care of your body. And so any type of health issues might be seen through the sixth house sign, as well as any planets in there as well. And then your first house and rising sign is all about the physical body as it's the body that you inhabit, the body that you are born into. It can describe your literal outer appearance modified by many other factors as well, not just the rising sign or first house, but it can describe your body, your body type. I also want to say to a lesser extent, the second house, because the second house is what you need. Your body needs nourishment and it needs food and sustenance and nutrition. So these can definitely fall under how to take care of your health. The second house are, is literally things that your body physically needs. It's the second house from the first, and the first is your body. So the second represents the resources that the body needs or that the body possesses. You can look at it that way, uh, the second as what your body, literally what your body needs and how to take care of it, how it needs, what it needs to feel secure and feel good. The second house is also, also about the senses, uh, intake of intake of experience through the senses and so that can include taking care of your body and what you're putting into your body so those were about all the questions that i received through my blog if you've left me a suggestion for a question thank you so much and and if your question was featured in this video i hope you got your a clear answer i hope if it, it's made sense to you if not i can always just clear it up for you in the comments. Stay tuned for the next one that I'll be doing, the next Q&A that I'll be doing. Uh, I'll, again, I'll be collecting the questions through my blog. If you're interested in sending in a question, please leave it to general-ish questions where everybody can learn from it and not just something specific to you or to your chart. But yeah, so I hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Um, thank you so much again for watching and leave a like if you've learned something valuable through this video and and subscribe if you haven't and i'll see you again soon for another video